My all-time favorite cast recording is the original Broadway cast recording of my favorite year. My favorite cast album is Into the Woods. My current favorite? It's hard to pick a favorite. The original company of A Chorus Line. The Crazy For You original Broadway cast recording. The hair. Seussical. Hamilton. The Chess Album. Side by Side by Sondheim. Cats. In the Heights. A Man of No Importance. The Tiffany Opera. Ragtime. Follies. I think I was about 13 I years old. Was the first was album that I bought with my, my own first money. first introduction to Every time I listen to it. It's real. It's real. I mean, Lainey Kazan. Elaine Pages Anthem. performance that was where the voice is amazing happened. and just that opening, opening number the incredible Our orchestrations by William Braun where the piano and drums and bass exactly play every and then suddenly the orchestra kicks Broadway in Broadway it's still so tingles. very relevant I just love it amazing amazing breathtakingly brilliant and it feels like you're in the theater for many of us cast albums are the way we first get to experience musicals allowing us to discover countless shows and memorable performers. A cast recording is the oral manifestation of the ephemeral experience of going to the theater. And it's either recreating it for you as a souvenir of the evening that you had, or ignite the imagination of the listener for the first time. It's essentially a souvenir. And on a serious level, it's the documentation of a work of art. This is Bill Rosenfield, a writer and former record producer who some of you may recognize from Playbill's web series, Old Show Queens. With record labels like RCA and EMI, he has been part of the creation of some of our favorite cast recordings. To start us off, I wanted to see if he could name me a favorite of his. Favorite? Absolutely not. Couldn't, couldn't possibly, couldn't, w no. Also, I wouldn't dare because I do know a lot of my favorite composers or whatever. And if they, if word got out that I said and not I'm screwed. So no. Formative ones, getting the album to Jenny with Mary Martin, I was nine. I didn't give any thought to what that entailed. It was just, oh, I've got more of Jenny. I have, the I have the playbill, I have the souvenir book, and now I have the album. I didn't become aware really of an album as an art form as something that, that opened my mind about what it was that an album was accomplishing. I think it was, of course, company, but also um, the album to the original Broadway Candide which I was given, I think, a couple of months after Company came out. Listening to that and Company, those were the things that made me see an art form of some sort. This beloved art form is part of a tradition that was forged by visionary record producers that elevated the cast album into an immersive experience. But the overall trajectory of the cast album has also shifted with changes in the music industry and the ever-evolving landscape of technology. In this episode, I'm going to be exploring the history of the cast album. You're going to hear me talk a lot about technology in this episode because I think it plays a vital role in our relationship with a cast album. From novelty to a prized and cherished possession to a readily available download in the palm of your hand. So to start us off, we're going to go back. I mean, way back. At the beginning of the 20th century, the first commercial sound recordings were sold as wax cylinders, but within a few years, records would take over the market. To record a song, the singer would perform directly into a horn, with the orchestra or band huddled closely behind. From the sound vibrations, grooves were etched onto wax. The impressions from this master disc were then reproduced onto a shellac disc, Rotating at 78 revolutions per minute on a phonograph player, these discs were known as 78s. You could fit three and a half minutes of sound onto a record, and eventually a whole seven minutes between both sides. In terms of Broadway music, these recordings were seen more as novelty than anything else. Oftentimes, the original performer wasn't even featured. There was the odd exception, with performers like Fanny Bryce and Burt Williams preserving their own performances. But these acoustic recordings captured limited frequencies. So while a dynamic performer like George M. Cohen could bring an audience to its feet on Broadway, his thin and reedy voice translated poorly to these phonograph recordings, which is why Bill Murray, Sorry, Billy Murray recorded many of George M. Cohen's songs in his stead. Broadway, 
Then in the mid-1920s came the electric microphone. This allowed more frequencies to be captured during a recording, and musicians no longer had to perform into a single horn. Music from Broadway at this time was usually covered by artists like Paul Whiteman, Ben Selvin, and their respective bands in their own unique style, doing away with verses and sometimes eliminating the lyrics altogether. Groups like the Victor Light Opera Company would use a show's original arrangements in their recordings, but at least in the United States, there wasn't yet a precedent or call to record Broadway tunes as they were heard in the theater. Curiously, the UK had already been paving the way for this tradition for several years. While the original 1927 production of Showboat boasted no recordings, the original 1928 London cast did record 10 songs from their production. The first significant step toward a cohesive Broadway recording was in 1938, when a small label called Musicraft Records committed to record songs from the Broadway musical The Cradle Will Rock. Featuring the original company and the show's author, Mark Blitzstein, the production's sparse and evocative sensibility was captured on seven 12-inch discs on 14 sides, more than any company had ever dedicated to a single Broadway show. The ambitiousness of this recording pushed right up against the technological limitations of the day. There were moments where you had to flip the record mid-scene to continue on. But this was still a huge step towards preserving the essence of a Broadway show. In March of 1943, the musical Oklahoma premiered on Broadway. The emotionally resonant story and Rodgers and Hammerstein's luscious score was a tonic in the midst of the Second World War, quickly making the show the hottest ticket on Broadway. Normally, this kind of success would have been met with a flurry of artists covering songs from the show, but there was a slight problem. As first move in a campaign to share fully in the profits of every commercial use of recorded music, the American Federation of Musicians, an AFL union, forbade its members to perform for any recording company. James Caesar Petrillo, the president of AFM, demanded that record companies pay royalties to a union unemployment fund for every recording sold, and that there be a wider use of live musicians in radio broadcasting. When those demands were not met, AFM members were barred from the recording studios as of August 1st, 1942, grinding the entire industry to a halt, though record companies like Decca and Columbia found ways to circle this issue. The first recordings from Oklahoma were covers by Bing Crosby and Frank Sinatra, both singing to a cappella vocal arrangements. Oh, what a beautiful morning. Oh, what a beautiful Jack Cap of Decca Records knew these recordings didn't reflect the songs as they were heard on Broadway, and on September 30th, 1943, Decca Records was the first company to agree to AFM's demands, while labels like RCA Victor and Columbia would hold out for almost a year. Normally, brand new arrangements would have been commissioned for dance bands or recording artists to cover these songs in their own style, but Decca Records hastily booked a recording session for October 20th, negating the proper time for this to be arranged. Thus began the precedent where a Broadway show was recorded with its own cast, its own orchestra, with its own conductor. During the recording session for Oklahoma, tempos for songs were accelerated, with other songs being altered or cut altogether to accommodate for the limited space on the 78 disc. In all, 12 songs, including an overture, were recorded, with not one running more than three and a half minutes. The album, titled Selections from the Theater Guild's musical play Oklahoma, was released on December 1st, 1943. When Martin Block played the whole album on his radio program, Make Believe Ballroom, the broadcast was so popular that they played the album again the following week. The cast album sold so well, a volume two was released in January 1945, with four additional songs that had not been recorded. In the end, Jack Cap's foresight paid off, and the success of Oklahoma's cast album shed light on a whole new market in the recording industry. Through the 1940s, record labels like RCA Victor and Capitol Records would join Decca in recording cast albums for new hit shows, like Brigadoon and St. Louis Woman, and wow, that album cover. 
These albums were generally well received, but their producers were finding the limited space on the 78 discs ever more frustrating. For the cast recording of A Connecticut Yankee in 1944, the listener literally had to turn the record over to hear the other half of Vivian Siegel singing To Keep My Love Alive. Then in 1948, Columbia Records artists and repertoire manager Goddard Lieberson announced the launch of the Long Playing Record, or the LP. Using a petroleum-based polymer called vinyl, these 12-inch discs were more supple, allowing more grooves to be etched in, giving a dynamic and fuller sound. Rotating at 33 and a third revolutions per minute, these discs could fit a whole 22 and a half minutes on both sides, opening new opportunities for the recording industry that reached far beyond Broadway. It would actually be Goddard Lieberson who would elevate the cast album to a whole new experience. While his career at Columbia would see him working closely with greats from the jazz and the pop world, Lieberson's contributions to the recording of musicals would make an indelible mark on the industry. Being a trained musician himself, he approached these recordings from a place of reverence for the traditions of the theater and the people who worked in it. On vinyl, his first cast recording as producer was Kiss Me Kate in 1949, Lieberson chose to maintain the show's song order to create a narrative experience for the listener. So while you weren't watching the show, you would still be able to follow the story. In consequential recordings, this would be the guiding principle in preserving a show on record. These recording sessions would be held at Columbia's 30th Street Studios. Due to unions, the album had to be recorded over the course of a day, usually the day off following opening night. Singers and musicians recorded live together, with the producer and engineers left to sort out physical spacing of all parties for the mix. This was a time where Broadway songs could still make airplay, and Goddard Lieberson was certainly conscious of that in the studio. Dialogue would only be included if absolutely necessary. Extended dance sequences were usually cut, though Lieberson might bring in a dance floor to record a short sequence. To prepare for a cast album, Goddard Lieberson got to know a show as well as possible. Leading up to recording the cast of South Pacific in 1949, he attended rehearsals, watched the show several times in and out of town, 14 times by his count. So as opposed to just bringing everyone in and hitting record, he wanted to get involved, know how to speak to actors and musicians about particular numbers, maybe even change an orchestral part just for the recording. All this work clearly paid off. During the week of August 20th, 1949, Billboard reported that the cast recording of South Pacific was the best-selling album in the country, with Kiss Me Kate in second. With the success of these albums, Lieberson now had executive powers at Columbia Records, giving him a wider breadth of choice in the projects he could take on. Record labels had already started the process of transferring their catalogs to vinyl, but Lieberson wanted to go back to scores of shows from the 20s, 30s, and 40s that he felt were neglected, like Rodgers and Hart's Pal Joey. A boycott between publishers and radio broadcasters in 1940 meant no songs from the show were recorded after its premiere. So in 1950, Goddard Lieberson committed to a studio cast album. With veteran conductor Lehman Engel at the helm, Lieberson hired Harold Lang from Kiss Me Kate to sing the title role, and Vivian Siegel, who had starred in the original production, to immortalize her legendary performance as Vera Simpson. The album inspired new interest in Pal Joey, and definitely helped contribute to a hit Broadway revival in 1952, where both Harold Lang and Vivian Siegel were brought on to star. But when Capitol Records recorded the revival's album, they opted to hire Dick Beavers and Jane Froman, rather than have Lang and Siegel re-record their parts. Fortunately, they did keep the production's young newcomer, Elaine Stritch, to record her Act Two showstopper, Zip. Zip. Walter Lippmann wasn't brilliant today. Goddard Lieberson's crowning achievement at Columbia Records came when he convinced William S. Paley, then the head of CBS, to invest $400,000 towards the capital of a new Broadway musical called My Fair Lady. The show opened to raves in March of 1956 and was a hit at the box office, making a cast recording a lucrative prospect. Fortunately for Columbia, CBS's investment had secured them exclusive rights to record the album. Upon its release in April 1956, the album surged to the number one selling album on the Billboard charts, staying there for eight consecutive weeks and remaining on the charts for 480 weeks. 
In 1959, Lieberson would travel to England to record the London cast recording, which featured the same principal cast from New York. This time, the album would be recorded in stereophonic sound. These new LPs had more sophisticated grooves, and the stylus could separate the sound into two separate complementary channels, allowing sound engineers to create a more realistic and ambient sound. This recording also introduced the Gatefold album, opening up like a book, these K-Series gatefolds featured liner notes, along with photos from the show and sometimes the recording session. My Fair Lady brought tremendous success to CBS and Columbia, and in June of 1956, Goddard Lieberson was promoted to president of Columbia Records. His gamble on the show did begin a competitive trend, where record companies would invest in Broadway shows in order to secure their recording rights, a trend of which Lieberson was never fond of. This trend in the recording industry would soon prove risky. The day after My Fair Lady's cast album was released, a new recording star made his television debut on the Milton Berle show. Here he is, a big reception for Elvis Presley! The divergence of musical theater from popular culture is probably too complicated to talk about here, though it's definitely worthy to revisit in a future episode. Basically, going into the 1960s, musicals started to seem frivolous, out of step and out of touch with the turbulent and fractious times. So naturally, as recordings from The Beatles, Bob Dylan, and The Rolling Stones grew in popularity, musical theater albums slowly fell away from the charts. RCA's Broadway recording of Hair, a rare musical that attempted to tackle the zeitgeist of the day, was the number one selling album for 13 consecutive weeks in 1969, but when it fell off the charts in October of that year, it was the last time in the 20th century where a cast album would hold a top spot in popular culture. As the musical theater fell out of step with popular culture, Stephen Sondheim was coming into his own. Goddard Lieberson had championed Sondheim early on, first as a lyricist and then as a composer, even pushing through a cast recording for Anyone Can Whistle after its colossal flop in 1964. When Columbia Records scheduled to record the cast album of Company for May 3rd, 1970, Goddard Lieberson found himself unavailable. In his stead, he enlisted Thomas Z. Shepard to oversee the session. Shepard had joined Columbia Records back in 1960, and while not a protege of Lieberson's in the one day all of this will be yours kind of way, Shepard had assisted on many of Lieberson's recording sessions, being a fly on the wall as he would later put it. There were similarities between the two. Both were accomplished musicians, and like Goddard Lieberson, Thomas Shepard invested significant time acquainting himself with the show. And while he would carry on many of the traditions he witnessed in Lieberson's sessions, he was also willing to break away and make his own creative decisions, like the inclusion of more dialogue leading into numbers like The Little Things. Harry, oh. you wanna stand there? <laughs> okay. I'm standing here. Now what? Well, darling, just come at me. Okay. Here we go. The recording session was filmed for D.A. Pennybaker's documentary film aptly named Original Cast Album, which, if you're a fan of John Mulaney's, may remind you of Co-op the Musical. If you don't know what I'm talking about, just Google and you'll see. Through the Penny Baker documentary, we follow the long recording session at 30th Street Studios, privy to discussions and debates in the control room, Sondheim's private grumblings over flubbed notes, watching him give notes to the cast on camera, which is not intimidating at all. The most memorable moment of the documentary, of course, is the final act, where a haggard Elaine Stritch struggles to perform her showstopper, The Ladies Who Lunch, in the wee hours of the morning. Eventually, Shepard and Sondheim decide that the orchestra will lay a backing track, and arrested Elaine Stritch will come back at a later date to record the vocal. A few days later, she returns to the studio, quaffed and in strong voice, to give the song another try. And, of course... It's a triumphant and satisfying end to the documentary, and of course, for fans of musical theater, a unique opportunity to witness a performer immortalize what we now recognize as a definitive and historic performance on record. Rise! 
Sondheim would record one more cast album with Columbia, A Little Night Music in 1973, working with Goddard Lieberson, Thomas Shepard, and a young sound supervisor named J. David Sachs. But after this session, Lieberson's ascent on the corporate ladder made him less available in the studio. So with Pacific Overtures in 1976, Sondheim followed Shepard and Sachs over to RCA, where he would record every project of his over the next 15 years. Now, Sondheim fans will note that there's a certain cast recording missing. The success of the company cast album naturally insinuated that Follies would be recorded by Columbia as well. But a temporary rift between CBS and director Hal Prince brought the recording rights to Capitol Records instead. I think that what happened was when sometimes people said, oh, and it'll be a two disc set because it's a lot of music and it's this and that. They went, oh, of course, of course, of course. And then they saw it and they went, this is so depressing. I mean, some of the numbers are good, but oh my God, we can't spend that money on this show. It's not going to run. Knowing the way record companies work, they said, you know something, we're just going to do one disc. A lot of cutting had to go into it. And a lot of, I think there were a lot of decisions made about what to include and what not to include, and they were inconsistent. There was no attempt made to allow you to follow a plot. Goddard Lieberson, you know, was good at choosing very carefully what dialogue would go in, and it would be two lines, and you'd get it. But Dick Jones, I gather he was a lovely man, but he was in over his head with a great deal of corporate pressure on his head. And he had to deliver it in five days. You know, that's always the way it was. So I think there were just a series of forced, misjudged decisions that made the album be kind of the incoherent, rough mixed mess that it was. Fortunately for fans of Follies, Thomas Shepard, through RCA's Red Seal Records, produced two performances of Follies in concert in 1985 at Lincoln Center with the New York Philharmonic. Featuring an all-star cast, the show's score was recorded mostly in its entirety and was recognized almost immediately as a historic preservation of the work. By this time, though, vinyl was on the decline. Cassette tapes had grown in popularity through the 1970s, with the transportable Walkman changing the idea of where and when people could enjoy music. The introduction of digital compact discs in the early 1980s was considered the biggest revolution in the music industry since the launch of the long-playing record, with improved sound quality and nearly double the amount of space for music. It was roughly around this time that Bill Rosenfield began his career at RCA as a freelance editorial coordinator. Organizing packaging and writing liner notes for albums, producing reissues of classic releases, writing the plot synopsis for the Broadway recording of Chess, which really deserves some kind of award. Eventually, he was promoted to Director of Artists and Repertoire for the Broadway branch of RCA. I was a kid in a candy store. I had a lot of luck because other recording companies were still music guys with an interest in theater. Um, and so I was a theater guy with, uh, who liked music. One of the best experiences I ever had was we were recording Legs Diamond. The recording was taking place on Monday, and this was Friday night, and everything was ordered and in place, and it was about 5.30, and Jay Sachs said, so do you want to hear the Legs Diamond album? And I went into his office and closed the door. He had the scores in front of him, and he had his stopwatch, and he went, Boom. Ba, 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 ba. And he went through the entire score, 76 minutes of music, and he just did every song. And he sang every song and did all the dance breaks and all of that. And that's what on Monday, I go into the studio, I know what the album is. I have the whole album in my head. It's not just tracks. And that was revelatory. And, and Jay was very good. He did it in collaboration with Peter Allen and Harvey Fierstein and Bob Ackerman and stuff. They sat in a room for eight hours and went through the script and talked about cuts to be made and stuff like that. But he was the captain, and so he knew what it was. And that's what I looked for whenever I didn't have Jay Sachs producing my album. I looked for that kind of authority and thought process. 
In the 1990s, the sound of musical theater began to change, or at least expand. Shows like The Who's Tommy and Rent brought forth a new kind of Broadway performer, like Alice Ripley, Michael Cerveris, Daphne Rubin Vega, Adam Pascal, and Adina Menzel. While still being Broadway performers, their musical sensibilities seemed to cross over into the mainstream sound. Both Tommy and Rent would receive cast albums, but when engaging with artists from these shows, the recording industry often didn't know how to market them. Essentially, the kinds of records at the time that they were interested in a Broadway performer to do was the show tune record, or, you know, and to really, they were pigeonholing them. This is Kurt Deutsch, the president of Ghostlight Records. But before entering the recording business, he had been working as an actor, along with his former wife, Sherry Renee Scott. Together, they formed Shikaboom Records in the year 2000, an independent label that aimed to bridge the gap between pop music and the theater world. Sherry and I were really thinking about, okay, well, let's give an outlet to our friends in the Broadway community who were interested in expanding that community beyond just uh, musical theater. The first albums we did were in 2000, and it was Sherry's album, Men I've Had, and um, Adam Pascal's album, Model Prisoner, and then we did Alice Ripley's album, Everything's Fine. And at the time, it was really, an, it, cast albums, in my mind, weren't really part of the picture of what we were trying to do. I was just an actor. I didn't know anything about the music industry. I was just kind of like, was an acting and directing major in college. All of this changed, however, in 2002. The intimate off-Broadway musical The Last Five Years, starring Sherry Renee Scott and Norbert Leo Butts, opened to mixed reviews and struggled to find an audience in the months following 9-11. But through Shikaboom Records, Kurt Deutsch saw an opportunity to preserve Jason Robert Brown's dynamic score within a business model that allowed the show's producers to maintain control over their properties. Where it was typical for RCA or some of the other major labels to pay for the recordings and then give a royalty, what I was thinking at the time, being this little independent entrepreneur record label, was why would producers give away what could be one of their biggest assets. And I basically said to Ariel Tepper and Marty Bell, who were the lead producers, I said, you know, if we make this record, it's not a very expensive record to make. We can put it out, we would own it, and hopefully it'll get licensed and people will listen to it and it'll have a life of its own. That's what happened basically is that the show itself closed. Not a lot of people saw the show, but MTI then licensed it. And the album, because it's a full listening experience, you really get a sense of what a cast album can be and do. The show, if you were to just kind of come in blindly to see the show, it's moving. But when you really dig deep into the show, it becomes even more emotional. Um, and I think that that's why the uh, cast album has become so relevant and, and a favorite amongst the musical theater crowd. The tremendous success of the last five years eventually led to the creation of Ghost Light Records, an imprint of Shikaboom Records, specifically dedicated to the production of cast albums. The emergence of Shikaboom and Ghost Light Records coincided with the beginning of music downloading. The music industry had gone through some rocky years, grappling with illegal file sharing programs like Napster, Kazaa, and LimeWire, forever changing the idea of how we obtain our music, even whether we should pay for it. Then in 2003, Apple introduced the advent of purchasing music online, allowing users to legally download individual songs and full albums. These advances in technology would eventually open up to streaming services we see today, services that Shikaboom and Ghostlight were quick to embrace in expanding their reach. But such changes would also have economic repercussions on the industry. Along with the departure of recording orchestral and film music in New York, many of the larger studios for cast albums began to close, making the production of these recordings a more complicated process. Oftentimes, chorus and orchestra members are separated into different studios, with principals recording in isolation booths. It's quite a departure from the days of Goddard Lieberson, but producers have found creative ways to maintain the energy of these influential recordings. In the Heights is a similar way where normally you'd put the band in the big room and then the cast would be in the isolation rooms. 
but with In the Heights, we actually isolated the band and put the cast in the big room. There was a big giant circle that we had for when we did 96,000, they could all see each other. And the same thing when we had the big choral moments, they were all in a line, so we could we were able to do that. So so it was a way it was a way to bring that modern sound yet still have it feel like a, a, a the energy of a cast album. There is a big studio that we do a lot of work in at the Demena Center on 37th Street, and they have a control room that's tied into two studios and so for example we did the kiss me kate recording in that and where we had a big giant we've done a bunch of records there but I, the kiss me kate is a, an example of kind of the way that you're talking about recording and the kind of goddard liebertson kind of way where paul gemignani is sitting there behind a chair it was really just kind of like old school warts and all and you just lay it down you start at nine o'clock in the morning and you finish at five o'clock in the afternoon and you come out there with a great record we did the same thing with she loves me and bridges of madison county you can do that because there's no synthesizers it's all acoustic so you can be in that big room and everybody can sing together and you can get the feeling of that kind of old school recording but now with a lot of the more modern records that we do you know there's a lot of electronic equipment you know you've got not orchestras you've got bands you know essentially so it becomes more complicated to kind of do it in the old school kind of way so we'll we'll track the band first a lot of the times and then we'll bring the vocals in and then we'll lay the chorus in so it's you know it's just every record is different you listen to something like Spring Awakening and Duncan Sheik, he likes to literally make everything like a pop record so that each uh, instrument is recorded separately for the most part, each singer is recorded separately. And so he's able to really control the mix. And I think dynamically, you know, what you, what you get is not necessarily the most alive sound, but orally just an incredible environment. You know what I mean? It's like you can just like bathe in that album if you wanted to. Nowadays, with streaming services like Apple Music and Spotify, we don't have as much of a physical relationship with our music. Experiencing an album with the gatefold or liner notes from a CD is largely a thing of the past. Though record labels have continued to produce physical copies, even limited releases on vinyl, for those who appreciate the warmer sound quality of these records. Much of the experience lost from a physical copy is translated into online content. It may not be something to hold in your hand, but it's still a way for the listener to appreciate the work of the artists involved. And I'm going to say this, I'm really looking forward to not saying things like It's a challenging time for the entertainment industry in these videos, even though it's still a very harsh reality to face. So how does a label like Ghostlight proceed when, at least in North America, there aren't any new shows being mounted? You know, do you put concept albums out? Do you put um, more solo albums out? I think that I'm really more of a of a kind of patient person, you know. And it's more about like, okay, let's we've been around for 20 years. Let's shine the light on the catalog. Let's build the catalog up. Let's talk about the catalog and the amazing things we've done over the past 20 years and amplify those voices. Um, and if it and and if a concept album wants to come out, then we talk about it. But at the end of the day, I feel like you know shows take a long time to get made, and let's make the shows, and then record the albums, and then license the shows, and then they can be done everywhere. So we'll be back, and when we're back, when Broadway's back, so we'll Ghostlight, and we'll make keep making records. Through all the changes in technology, and even the shows themselves, it's easy to feel a creeping sense of nostalgia, and I think there is validity in that discussion. But ultimately, with streaming services and online content being driving forces in the music world, the potential to reach new audiences is greater than ever, as well as the chance to inspire the next generation of theatre. To keep art alive, you have to be open to change, and hopefully, sooner than later, we'll be able to enjoy cast albums from brand new shows and a whole new generation of writers and performers. Ben directed 
Leslie Kritzer doing Patti Lapone at Joe's Pub. And we were re going to record that. And Patti was like, Dal, why are you going to record that when I have all the tapes of my original stuff? And I said, um, I said, well, Patti, give me the tapes. That's what I looked for whenever I didn't have Jay Sachs producing my album. And for the most part, I succeeded. Um, but there were some times where they didn't get it and, and I would, the recording suffered. Okay. But no names. They didn't because it stank. Right. And um, uh, we're not, re uh, stop recording. Okay. Okay, stop it. <laughs>